So I'd like to call for our fourth speaker, and this is Professor uh, Manu Prakash from uh, the Stanford University. And uh, he will speak about his work in uh, putting physics in the service of uh, improving global health. Thank you for inviting me. It's an absolute uh, honor uh, uh, to talk at this meeting. Uh, I think one of the things I'm going to try to do is uh, share a little bit of a broader vision for what we've been trying to do uh, in the context of a word that I'll use very often. I call it frugal science. Uh, the idea that uh, I want you to just for a moment think a little bit about this. You know, we're the lucky ones uh, who have access to a lot of scientific tools. Uh, and uh, the world, in a broader sense, uh, doesn't actually have, there is a limitation in access to science. So most of the talk really will be focused about it. But I'll try to give you a few examples where we do uh, span in and start thinking about it in the context of global health and education. Uh, where do physicists fit in that picture? Uh, so uh, this is, uh, none of this work would be uh, possible without the students that I work with. Uh, uh, we do have a very scatterbrained lab. Uh, much of it is in uh, biological physics that I won't actually touch on today itself. Uh, but there are a remarkable group of people that I get a chance to work with and be inspired. Uh, one of the works that I'll talk about is with my graduate student, Jim, another postdoc, Saad Bamla. Uh, but one of the important aspects of working uh, on a topic like this, uh, which have a societal implication, that we have to work with society. So there are an incredible number of people uh, out in the field that we work with uh, that have truly shaped uh, much of the work that I'll mention. Uh, so let's start uh, with the challenge. Uh, this is a picture that I took in Ghana. Uh, and uh, needless to say, uh, this is what a school, an average school in the world actually looks like. Now you might not care, because this seems very far away. But ironically, if you think deeply about it, uh, we have a challenge in education where kids don't get to directly experience science, whether that's in a developing or a developed country. Uh, one billion kids in the world today, if by UN standards, live in families that are $1.25 uh, per day. That's the poverty standard. One billion kids out of two billion kids that are actually in this world. So what are the tools of creativity? What are we going to provide them to be the group of people who are going to tackle some of the most important problems that we will actually leave behind for them on this planet? Uh, now, this is another picture. It just so happens uh, that I took this picture in Ghana as well, uh, which is this idea that a bus stop is not a hospital. Uh, this is a group of patients uh, waiting uh, patiently once a week for a doctor to arrive in a little van once a while that arrives. Uh, several of these kids actually have malaria and uh, a deadly disease, which if it not detected and treated uh, within a couple of weeks' time uh, can actually lead to death. Uh, and if you look at the statistics of this, roughly one billion people on the planet, again, are living without access to roads, electricity, or traditional health care. Uh, and this is far off sometimes and quite removed from our daily lives. Uh, so I want you to just picture some of the extreme challenges we face on this planet. And what, as physicists, can we do to contribute? I know we can't tackle and solve all the problems or have these problems go away, but I do believe there are uh, instances where we can engage in this broader community and the broader set of challenges. Uh, this is probably the most heartbreaking picture that I have taken in my life. And this is the only picture like this I'll actually show. But I just want you to understand the problem, because you have many solutions. And I want you, to, when you walk away from this, to be thinking about some of these problems. Uh, I was in Tororo, Uganda. This happens to be the highest infectivity rate of malaria in the world. In a single day, you might get bitten by five to seven mosquitoes that are infectious. So imagine the number of times you could potentially get infected in an entire year. Uh, I walked through, of course, I didn't speak the local language, and my interpreter uh, told me, do you know what the kids uh, were sitting on? And there's a pregnant one mother in the background. They're actually sitting on the grave uh, of their brothers and sisters. Infectious diseases still today, I mean, just malaria alone, the number's around 400,000 a year. When you really uh, combine the impact that infectious diseases have, where we do have solutions, we have a drug. You could get a drug to a person with malaria and cure them. Uh, 
And this is actually one of the field sites that we work in. So the challenge of what I describe frugal science is the idea that although knowledge is slowly becoming really accessible, very soon it will be free to all, experience of science is not. So how do we really bring, when I say access to science, I don't mean Khan Academy and Wikipedia. I truly mean the experience that all of you turned in into science, which was the aha moment. Uh, and personally, the work that I'll share, uh, there will be few examples of tools and gadgets that we've built, but mostly the work that we do is to really enable communities around the world to experience that aha moment in a hope that eventually that leads to uh, something remarkable at a later time. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time in the field over the last couple of years, and many of these people have truly inspired us to do what we do. Uh, there is a gentleman here in Uganda who, once we talked about the type of tools we wanted to bring to the table, uh, he said, what you're really trying to do is do diagnostics under a tree to be able to detect a disease with no electricity, no other infrastructure other than a set of tools uh, which are affordable. Uh, and that's the mantra that I'll talk mostly about. Uh, so now, it's not all doom and gloom. There is a bright side to the story. Uh, this is Alex, uh, another person in Uganda. He has five years of uh, biomedical uh, research training. And I asked him, where is your lab? And he showed me, you're in my lab. And those uh, beds, when they don't have a patient, actually is where I do my tests and assays. And of course, you can see it's an empty lab. So the types of tools that we think about uh, are primarily the tools that Alex would want to use. Uh, and this is uh, the group of communities that we would like to essentially enable. Community health workers are primarily, I mean, many of you have heard of Ebola. Uh, I'm hoping uh, that it probably didn't impact you. It did not impact you primarily because community health workers around the world, with very little other than just a plastic bag that they could wrap around, did go in these communities, detect patients, uh, try to cut the transmission. Uh, so it is an important community to empower, whether it directly affects you or not. Uh, so now let me transition. Uh, this is going to be a collection of ideas. Uh, you can take and leave whichever ones you like. Uh, but I just want to give you a flavor of the types of things uh, that me as a physicist uh, tries to do in these set of problems. Uh, the first is the phase of uh, what I call physics of parasites. Uh, this is an incredible disease, uh, schistosomiasis. Uh, and one of the aspects of it's called the neglected tropical diseases that maybe many of you might not have heard of it. Uh, after malaria, it has the highest impact uh, from uh, Dali on a country. Uh, and the reason for that is 200 million people in the, current, in the world are currently infected. Now, the puzzle is quite fascinating. The only way you can get infected with schistosomiasis is if you walk in water that's infected with this parasite. There is a snail that essentially transmits uh, the parasite, and it quite literally penetrates your skin without any wounds uh, to infect you. Lots of water bodies around the world are infected, and we started asking the question of what could we do. Um, and we figured out that there is an Achilles heel in this disease. Although it's a very impactful disease, it turns out it is a metamorph form, and it does not actively intake any nutrients. It has no effective mouth. So after a 12-hour period, uh, the parasite actually dies. It's being released from the snail and searching for you when you're walking around uh, and effectively uh, infecting you in that short period of time. And if that search is unsuccessful, uh, the parasite would die. Um, and of course, uh, uh, as the first thing you would do, you would ask, let's just watch what it does. So we were able to get this parasite in our lab. Uh, we wear double gloves. Uh, we also take uh, drugs to make sure that we're not infected. Uh, but we discovered something <laughs> quite remarkable. So first of all, here's a, such an important parasite, and nobody knew how it swims. Uh, you're watching a single parasite, maybe around 300 microns. It actually detects gravity. So it sinks down and swims up and optimizes for a layer of height in a fluid in which it's expecting its host. So for the parasites that actually infect fish, they are found at a different height. For humans, they're really at the interface. When you look, dig deeper, it actually poses a really fun challenge. For some of you who think about hydrodynamics, the stroke of this parasite seemingly looks very reversible, which wouldn't make any sense from the Purcell's theorem. And what it does as a controller is to bring that irreversibility at a torsional joint at this point. 
So you can write down a couple of equations, and effectively from this, you can write down the efficiency of swimming with this mode. Uh, uh, we actually built some robots, because uh, very little genetics can actually be done with this animal, uh, to really understand how torsional stiffness tunes. And what it turns out, there is an effective torsional stiffness at which the swimmer is the most efficient. So some of you can see this. This is very low stiffness. This is very high stiffness. None of these robots go anywhere. And only the most uh, optimal torsional stiffness is the one that swims. Now, what this has led to from this theory is a different kind of an idea to actually tackle this disease. So now we can add human cues. We can add chemotaxis on this. And what we're really trying to do with this is to be able to reduce its efficiency of finding humans. So it's not a drug as if you would give to a patient to cure them, but it's a drug that you would add in the water that would essentially increase that time frame that I showed you. Uh, very much in the same approach of how we confuse mosquitoes to make humans invisible to them, uh, the same idea to really be able to make this uh, parasite not be able to detect and find humans. So I'll keep switching uh, in my uh, potpourri of uh, ideas. Uh, Another one which is important, which when you go out to the field, the first thing you realize uh, is mosquitoes and mosquito-transmitted diseases play a huge role. Um, if you ask yourself this question of how many species of mosquitoes that are out there, I'm just curious if you've ever thought about that question before. Um, how many species of mosquitoes? Um, so it turns out there is roughly around 3,500 species. Uh, that's a lot, and if you go catch one, uh, how do you detect what's, what mosquito is actually is? Uh, and when you do uh, mathematical modeling, you can, this is uh, for Aedes aegypti, uh, you can uh, look at asking a question, where are these mosquitoes? So Aedes aegypti, some of you, uh, if you've heard of Zika and Dengue, is one of the primary transmission mechanism. Uh, but the challenge is, in the entire computational modeling for Aedes aegypti distribution for the entire continent of Africa, there's only 500 data points. So this map is not just the distribution of uh, mosquitoes, it's actually the distribution of entomologists, uh, because those are the entomologists that were out there who partially collected this data. So we started asking, how do you change this? How do you really bring a set of tools that anybody around the world could actually map mosquitoes? Uh, this is how it's conventionally done. When I am out in the field, uh, I roll up my sleeves, and I wait for a mosquito to sit and bite me. Uh, this is the primary way that you would collect uh, human biting mosquitoes. This is exactly how Ronald Ross, 100 years ago, actually detected that mosquitoes transmit malaria. Uh, so we started asking a question, and we stumbled upon a very simple idea. Uh, I'm sure you have recognized this uh, favorite buzz of yours. Uh, anytime who's ever been in a place around mosquitoes, they buzz in your ear. And 2009, uh, a beautiful paper came out that actually talks about conversations between males and females. What they're really doing, evolutionarily, are converging to their love songs. These songs are produced by the near-field vortices from the wings, and because of that evolutionary uh, mating uh, technique, uh, essentially mosquitoes have separated frequency bands. So we started asking a very simple question. Could we, uh, using regular conventional cell phones that you might be carrying in your pocket, actually detect species of mosquitoes? And what we ended up finding is the fact that not only you can collect a regular cell phone, you can record a signature of a flying mosquito. It maps directly to what you would record through a high-speed camera. And the SNR on most of the regular phones that are out there is good enough to actually collect the signal. Uh, and not only that, it actually turns out that dumb phones that cost 5 to $20 perform equally well to many of these smartphones. Uh, and there are roughly around 5 billion phones on this planet uh, that could potentially do this. Uh, and using that, we build the world's largest data set of uh, mosquito acoustics. So if you're looking at all the 20 species that are known to transmit human diseases, and you can start seeing that some of them cluster uh, quite far away, and some of them actually do have overlaps. And all of this data was collected from uh, an old phone uh, uh, roughly around uh, 10 years old. 
Um, and one of the things that it starts to do is it starts to create a community of people that can go out there, record acoustic data, and map acoustic uh, mosquito species. So this is a village in Madagascar that we work in. Um, we're able to use machine learning techniques to be able to identify uh, with a 70% likelihood for detecting the species that are known to transmit diseases. But at that same time, with a volunteer group, we're able to map an entire village to demonstrate the distribution of mosquitoes, especially the ones that carry human diseases. Uh, this is data collected in a single day. Uh, and if any of you are interested, you can go to this website called abuzz.stanford.edu, download the code, and you can upload depending on if you live at places where there are mosquitoes. Uh, so let me transition uh, to a couple of diagnostic tools. Uh, and the story for the next one begins in Uganda. Uh, with a very simple observation uh, that we made, uh, which is diagnostics is all about looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, because eventually, the parasite that you're looking for is really not so abundant, otherwise the patient would actually be dead. And a process called centrifugation is commonly used to identify and separate these parasites. Centrifuges are conventionally bulky and expensive, they actually require electricity. Uh, so coming back from one of these trips in Uganda, um, I started thinking a lot about spinning toys. And since I don't have that much time, I'll just give you some examples. Many of you have played with yo-yos. Um, a very good yo-yo throw is uh, roughly around 4,000 RPM. Uh, so, you know, aha, that's actually an interesting mechanism to be able to separate samples. Uh, but that's not enough. And what we started asking is a very simple question. Fundamentally, with just using human power, what is the fastest spinning object that you could make? And it turns out uh, this problem has been solved by human creativity 5,000 years ago. It turns out this is a whirly gig, which is a button on a string, something that... How many of you have actually played with this toy? OK, I can see the older generation. Uh, these toys don't get that popular anymore. It, this is a remarkable object. First of all, this is, as far as we know, the oldest toy in human history. But what's remarkable, 5,000 years ago, we found relics of this. Uh, what's even more remarkable is we didn't know how it worked. Uh, so we asked this question, how fast can an object like this spin? And you can essentially write down a couple of terms for the twist drag for this, the input torque, and the air drag to essentially write this as a nonlinear oscillator. So all I'm doing is I'm spinning and pushing and putting. And I'm injecting energy in this rotating object. And just using and parameterizing these equations, we're able to optimize this object to spin not at 10,000 RPM, but around 125,000 RPM. So at that time, when we published this paper, we held the world record for the fastest spinning object with human power. Uh, and of course, uh, of curiosity of mankind is wonderful. Uh, there is a recent paper that came out that actually breaks our record. They moved the needle. We moved the needle two orders of magnitude. Now the record is 200,000 uh, rotations per second. Why am I stressing on this record? The reason I'm stressing on this record, so this is uh, Saad. This is a normal centrifuge. This is as effective a centrifuge with 30,000 G forces that we can use anywhere. The reason I'm stressing on this is within 90 seconds, and if I had more time, it would have been wonderful for me to do this test. I would have taken a drop of blood, put it on a capillary, mounted on the scope, and within 90 seconds, I can separate out all the plasma in the red blood cells. This is a standard test for anemia. Around 2 billion people in this world potentially should be tested for anemia, majority of them being uh, pregnant mothers. What's even more remarkable, is RDTs, the classic rapid diagnostic test that's been really the front fighter for malaria, work efficiently if you use pure plasma, because the enzymes from the blood cells when they get lice mess up with the test. So here's a very, very simple technique to really be able to do this out in the field. Now, why did I stress on that 200,000 RPM? We can actually use the same example to separate out not just major components, but single parasites 
a malaria-infected blood cell has an effective density that's different from a regular blood cell. So by spinning it, and currently our time of spin is 15 minutes, I would like to reduce this back uh, to two or three minutes. And that's why I want to leave it the challenge as well. As I told you, I came here looking for ideas. Uh, develop another spinning object that does an order of magnitude faster. We did the theory for this. It turns out our mathematical limit is around a million RPM. And the only reason I didn't demonstrate a million RPM rotation device, which would have caused a bang in this room, because that would break the Mach 1 number, uh, is the fact that human anatomy cannot inject energy at 10 hertz, which is what I need. So even if I try really hard, some of you who play musical instruments know you cannot go above a certain frequency. Muscle output power falls down. So we're now building a double oscillator that will allow us to inject energy into another system that can move faster. Uh, now, much of this is valuable when it reaches people. And this would be the last portion of the last 10 minutes of what I want to talk about. This is a field site in Madagascar. We are seven to eight hours walking distance from any known roads. A kid here that gets malaria actually has to be carried by their parents on their back that distance. And this is the first place that we are starting to run clinical trials on this for malaria. Uh, and just for some of the physicists in this room who have never been to a clinical trial, this is what a clinical trial looks like. Uh, and uh, these are some of our colleagues from Madagascar who are processing through samples uh, and talking at the same time. Um, OK. Uh, I think one of the other things that ends up happening is you might be realizing that I am really building some very simple things. You know, this object cost me 20 cents to make. And once we publish that, uh, there are tons of papers that have come out. Uh, now there is a cell phone charger using a system of piezoelectricity in this device. Uh, there are a couple of papers uh, that essentially talk about uh, pushing the bounds for this uh, for many other uh, biological assays. Uh, but it's wonderful to see once an idea is floated in a community, the community takes it forward. Um, and because of that, I want to end with uh, the last project, uh, which is a fold scope. Uh, and I'm actually curious, depending on how much time, how many of you have actually used a fold scope? Yay, OK. Uh, maybe 2% maybe people in this room. And I'll explain to you why we're not there yet. Uh, we need to move that needle further. Uh, another challenge in diagnostics is microscopy. But also, microscopy is the bread and butter for uh, life sciences and much of uh, small-scale physics. Uh, and uh, if any of you walk around this city in LA and just randomly ask a person, have you actually seen through a microscope? Or have you actually seen your own blood cells? Um, I'm curious what the answer would be, but majority of them would actually say no. Maybe they have seen something in high school, uh, and in most countries in the world, when you give your exam for microscopy, and this is what I did, I grew up in India, you actually draw the parts of a microscope, because I had never touched a microscope, but of course I knew exactly where the objective lenses are and where the knobs are, because you're supposed to draw. Uh, so there is the analogy there that access to science uh, can completely change how people uh, think about science. Uh, so we took this challenge almost five years ago, and we asked ourselves this question, could we manufacture microscopes just like printing books and printing newspapers? And the result of that is this object. I'm holding a microscope in my hand. At that time, we built many different microscopes. For a price point of a dollar or a dollar fifty, uh, we can get to 700 nanometer resolution imaging. And uh, that was really fun. Uh, and one of the things that starts to happen. The real reason we could do this from an optical point of view is uh, some of the fat lens equations for uh, highly curved surface lenses and the apertures that you need to optimize this for reducing the aberrations hadn't been solved. We solved that equation and we got those calculations to then finally build instruments uh, that we can do bright field, fluorescence, dark field, all kinds of uh, microscopy systems. And we actually use these tools in diagnostics. So this is the exact same disease that I had mentioned to you, schistosomiasis, 200 million people infected. We can go into a school and diagnose every single kid and essentially have the school community diagnose them. And when we ran our clinical trial for this in Kenya, we actually found almost 30% of all kids were positive of schistosomiasis. And the only way that people talk about this is schistosomiasis is a terrible disease, is uh, you get uh, cancer of the urinary bladder, and you get blood in the pee, 
And in many of these communities, if a kid, a boy, that is not peeing blood, uh, the parents might think that, oh, there's something wrong with it. Uh, because uh, it's thought to be the equivalent of menstrual cycle for men. Uh, so this is how prominent this disease is. One of the things that starts to happen is when we publish this paper, and this is where, um, uh, this is probably the most jo joyful moment for me, um, is, you know, you write a paper and it comes out, and then you say, what am I going to do next? And uh, we've done many other things, but we made a decision at that time that if we truly believe that we can build and manufacture a tool like this, we are going to build 50,000 of these microscopes in the lab. So we turned the lab into a factory, a couple of robots, and we assembled and built uh, primarily robotically 50,000 of these tools. And we posted on our website, anybody who would like to get a microscope can request one. Um, I ship, when I ship to Sudan, I pay $25 for just the shipping itself for an instrument that costs $2 to make. Uh, but that did something very special, which we had not realized, which is it created a worldwide community of curious people that took the idea forward. Uh, as of today, we have shipped around 400,000 of these instruments to 130 countries in the world, and what has done is really created a network of uh, amateur microscopists, for that matter. Many of them are... Uh, Researchers, I can see some of them in this room, actually. Um, and one of the threads that it does is it creates not just a solution, but a way, a platform that people can build different solutions on. Uh, by 2018, we would like to cross a million. Uh, and I just want you to remember that number one billion, because that's the number of kids that have absolutely no access to science. And it would be nice if we reached two billion. There's only 800 million bicycles uh, on this planet. So that's a big, tall order. Um, and the world that we would like to imagine is where every single kid has an access, uh, not just to uh, reading science, but to doing science. This is a picture in Madagascar, fourth poorest country in the world, but an extremely high biodiversity index, which we are losing at a very fast pace. And um, this is a picture in India. Uh, for me, one of the important aspects of this work was what this community does with this tool and how do we support them. Uh, and we took a lot of ideas from the world of astronomy and amateur astronomy. The fact that there are these, all these telescopes pointing into the sky, they can talk to each other, they can make discoveries that actually get published in the literature. Uh, we built a publishing platform for every single person they can write and make their observations, deposit that data. They get a DOI number that anybody else can reference. Many, many papers have been written by uh, people. Uh, here is an example of a cervical cancer test that was uh, done using the same tool, and it's actually then been published in Peru. Here is a new method for detecting counterfeiting uh, uh, pills to be able to detect whether the pill that you're about to take is fake or real. Uh, a program in Latin America to really scale up and map uh, dengue uh, using uh, detecting uh, uh, Aedes aegypti. And this is actually a, a massive uh, portfolio of projects that have been created by the community itself. You can go to this site and uh, contribute to it. The reason I'm taking some time here is we can manufacture microscopes. We can't manufacture mentors. And that's where much of the scientific community comes in, is to be able to engage with this community at a very deep level so you can change their attitudes about science directly. Uh, I'll show a quick video of the community itself. So this is a video from Northeast. Uh, this is the last place where uh, the Indian rhino lives. This is the only microscopy workshop that I did where my students came with guns in the room because they are uh, patrol officers that actually uh, protect those rainforests. This is the type of data that comes out of a microscope. This is a sandfly that carries leishmaniasis. This is data coming out of Panama. Uh, this is inner circulation in a crustacean, a developing ant. And you can go on and think about thousands and thousands of examples of data that's primarily collected by a community. That's a diatom right there. Uh, this is a group in Madagascar. And one of the contexts there is you'll notice uh, an idea that this kid comes up with of uh, watching parasites uh, that, of course, many uh, uh, grow on our heads. Uh, this is another, the same group in Madagascar. Uh, that's Tanzania. Uh, much of the work in Tanzania is around sanitation. 
to really be able to show that if you can teach germ theory from scratch, could you change people's habit for washing hands? Uh, we have a large group in India uh, with many languages that are translated. Uh, and one of the factors about this, now this is Lebanon. Uh, this is something very dear to me. Uh, around 500,000 to a million kids are not going to school just in Lebanon alone. Much of these are refugees from Syria. Um, and we're starting a new program to essentially de deploy some of these tools in that group itself. Now this is United States. And in a moment, you will see <laughs> one of those aha moments I had talked about. Right there. I think you figured out what he said. You know, science is very, uh, it's very visceral, it's very emotional. And it's extremely important that we carry that emotion as well as the knowledge that, that we share with people. Uh, okay, so I should close. Uh, uh, much of this is also done in the context of science itself. Many of these tools are being used uh, by communities uh, to do ecology, for that matter. Uh, in the Peruvian jungle, in the mapping of what's actually happening in Antarctica and Arctic, uh, here is a lone sailor right now with his sailboat trapped in the Antarctica, sending data from one of these tools itself to the community. Uh, we translate much of these instructions. If any of you are interested and speak languages other than English, we would love for you to translate. And I'll leave with this uh, picture. Uh, I like this image uh, because it really shows that we all have an inner child in us. Uh, and much of the times, we're really struggling hard to bring science to kids. We just need to bring science to ourselves. And uh, there's a parents that are not willing to share their tool with the kid itself. Uh, I'll stop there, and I can take any questions. Thank you, thank you. Can I ask which country you're from? Okay, yeah, yeah. So we have one field site in Nigeria. We should connect you to one of the groups. Any other questions? Um, I'm sure some of you have already figured out at the back of the napkin how to uh, break that 200,000 record. But yeah, I'm curious, uh, uh, any other questions people might have? Please ask questions. It makes the speaker feel good. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, since, uh, since no one's asking anything, um, I'm just curious what the funding source is for all of these microscopes, because you said you initially made just a few thousand, and now yeah. you have so many. So we made the first 50,000. That was primarily done uh, with philanthropy, uh, asking foundations. Uh, uh, but then after that, we have bootstrapped. Uh, now uh, there is an entity that we have established outside, because we tr really are trying to cross hundreds of millions uh, in numbers. And that's primarily supported by people. So when you buy a microscope for your child, you're actually supporting 10 of those microscopes for the kids somewhere else. So it's the Tom's model of shoes. Mm. Uh, this is work that's not dependent on charity, because that might not scale. Mm. Uh, we have contracts uh, and uh, implementation plans with governments. So both Madagascar, India, much of that work is actually done by the government itself. Uh, we've been working hard to work with the US government. That has not been very successful. <laughs> yeah, yes. This was great. Um, you, know, you make a centrifuge, a microscope. Are there many other <laughs> devices you can make? Do you yeah. have other things in the pipeline? Yeah, I didn't have time. Uh, we have lots of tools in the pipeline. We have. Uh, a new molecular diagnostic tool to be able to handle molecules in classrooms that is primarily inspired by the Victorian era music boxes. Uh, and some of you program punch cards. I'm not going to ask you to raise your arms. 
but it's the same set of mechanisms, but for doing chemistry. Uh, we have an electron microscope that we have just finished the first version of, uh, that we are trying to challenge ourselves to build a fully functional electron microscope, 50 nanometer resolution at a price point of $200. Uh, so it's a new way of thinking about vacuum-free uh, electron microscopy. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that I wanted to come and talk is, you know, why do I get to have all the fun? <laughs> uh, is, uh, I mean, in this room exists talent to primarily solve many of these problems. And whether it might be a weekend project for you or something that you might dedicate a lot of time to, I think much of physics is inspired by the fact that you re-question all your assumptions. And scientific tools, the way we ask a question, you really have to learn to ask how to not assume what somebody else assumed even 100 years ago. So this is much more of a call to the community rather than all the work that we might do. Yes. So George Whitesides and others have developed this paper-based you know, diagnostics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of combining this technology with? Yeah, yeah, I actually put in my slides, I put a picture of George. Uh, he's quite influential and has played an incredible role in terms of thinking about uh, uh, what people have done out in the field, uh, we have been building a test on uh, the this one of these assays. I forgot to mention this. Uh, some of these systems are actually integrated systems where post centrifugation you run the test on these systems itself. So these are sort of disposable disks that does all kinds of valving and much of the conventional tests that you would do, but now including centrifugation as a step. We can take one last question and then we should, uh, yes. I was just wondering, I'm Greta from the Liquid Crystal Institute in Kent, Ohio, and I was just wondering, first, just for fun, do your students also get to go and experience um, with you? And second... It's required. Uh, it's required, <laughs> okay, yes, great. Yes. And then second, I was just curious, um, do you also plan to make the drug delivery to those countries accessible and cheap? Uh, meaning yeah. uh, uh, generate drugs that are yeah. cheaper. So I'm not a chemist. Uh, I think this is a phenomenal problem. But we don't realize for majority of infectious diseases, so for malaria, for example, the market has been flooded with drugs. The WHO has a mandate by 2030 to eliminate malaria from 35 countries. We don't have that much time. And the drug is there, but because it's used without diagnostics, what ends up happening is it's overused and resistance is starting to develop. And we don't have a second line drug other than the artemisin treatments. So this is quite dangerous to only have drugs. The same story with schistosomiasis. People are treated before they are diagnosed. This is why diagnosis becomes very important. Not that we don't have treatments, you just don't know. If I give randomly a pill to all of you, none of you would be cured. You really have to give the right pill to the right person. I'll stop there, thank you. <laughs>